So like I said earlier, my name is Sean Fitzgerald and I'm speaking to you today from Jasper, Alberta. I'd like to begin today's meeting by acknowledging that Physiotherapy Alberta's offices are located on Treaty 6 territory as well as the Métis Nation of Alberta's Region 4, while I'm also speaking to you from Treaty 8 territory in Jasper, Alberta. Um, these territories have been and continues to be the home of many Indigenous peoples since time immemorial. Physiotherapy Alberta recognizes that Indigenous peoples have been helping many live healthy lives on this land long before settlers arrived. With that, we commit ourselves to helping move people forward in their journey towards a good life and doing so in a way that follows the spirit and intent of treaty, that of peace, friendship, and understanding. We also recognize that people from across Alberta and beyond are joining us today, and we encourage you to take a few moments to learn more about the lands, peoples, and treaties with which you may be in relationship. It is my pleasure today to welcome Jason Cully. Jason is a partner at Field Law who devotes a significant portion of his practice to advising clients in the practice area of professional regulation. Jason serves as a legal advisor in a variety of matters, including governance, conduct and discipline, and professional development. Jason believes in staying informed and frequently writes articles on recent developments in professional regulation. He has also provided training on a variety of topics. So I'd like to welcome Jason, and I'm gonna hand it over to you, Jason. So take us away. Thanks, Sean, and thanks to everyone for spending the lunch hour with me. I, but I'm always appreciative that people make time to come and listen to these kinds of things and get some further education. And although we are scheduled for 90 minutes, I do anticipate we'll finish earlier than that. I don't imagine we'll go long, and there should be time for questions and answers prior to the expiry of that time. So hopefully we'll have things running smoothly here. And I am pleased to present today on the topic of professionalism in the era of social media. And forgive me if I sound like an old hat while I'm talking here where I may misunderstand some of the issues of social media, but that's some of the generational things that we're gonna talk about and how that, that will certainly impact how some people view social media and its relationship to professionalism. But we're also gonna talk about some of the regulatory aspects in the use of social media, which are important for everyone who is a physiotherapist and who is a member of the regulated profession. When we're talking about social media, we're really talking about how individuals have this opportunity to express themselves in more ways and in a more public sphere than they have had in the past. So social media has really changed the way that some individuals communicate with each other, uh, even about themselves and with the wider community at large. If you are a member of a regulated profession, like a physiotherapist, and you are expressing your views on social media, like other people, that raises the question of, is there anything unique about your views and expressions through social media and those as other people more generally from the public? Are you here expressing your views as a private citizen, talking about your free speech, those kinds of issues? Or are you in that category of a professional whose commentary is subject to scrutiny from your regulatory body, which in this case would be Physiotherapy Alberta? And these are the type of tough questions that regulators and members of the profession have to grapple with and assess when they're assessing the impact of social media on their behaviors as a member of the profession and on um, their regulatory functions when we're speaking of the college itself. And I would say that this topic is somewhat timely. I mean, we've just come through a few years when we've had less face-to-face -face interactions and communications with each other. And while we've certainly been interacting over video and other means, there has also been an increased engagement over social media to give individuals that sense of connection. We've also had recent case law that has been of some interest. I mean, it might just have been interest to lawyers, but that's the sphere I run in, so it has been of interest to us. Of uh, A case out of Saskatchewan, which involves a registered nurse who made certain comments on Facebook, and that gained certain notoriety with respect to the balancing of her ability to make those comments on Facebook and what her regulator could do in response to those. So we're gonna talk about those issues in detail here today. I, this is where I say that I'm a little bit of an old hat. When I first started giving t discussions and having 
training on social media, we used to have to define what social media was. I mean, I don't think I really need to do that anymore, but anyway, here it is where social media is computer-based technology that facilitates the sharing of ideas, thoughts, and information through the building of virtual networks and communities. I think we can all agree that the use of it is now ubiquitous. You can see here that 73% of Canadians use social media daily. With respect to what the leading site is, I don't think it'll come as much surprise to everyone that in Canada it remains Facebook. Maybe that will change in the future, but that's still the case now. And even in the fastest growing social media in Canada remains Instagram. Again, maybe that will change in the future. One surprising issue that arises is what the most popular activity is on social media. And I was surprised to learn that it's sending private messages, but that makes some sense. And when we're talking about social media, we're talking about all of the different things that are generally included where we think of Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, even LinkedIn, and TikTok. And I'm sure there's other ones that the youth are hip with that I don't know. And just when I say hip, I realize how, date, how much I'm dating myself in that regard. When we talk about how social media impacts on professionalism, it's not so much the issues of the technical aspects of social media, so I'm not going to talk about any, anything else in that regard today, but it's really about the way that social media is used. So certainly social media posts have similarities to other verbal and written communications, things like face-to-face -face conversations, emails, but there's also something unique about them as well. People will often use these types of platforms to, as you know, online diaries, a place to broadcast their views, their interactions through the day, even their grievances. Although it's like other forms of written communication, like even an email, there's still something about the instantaneous nature of social media, as well as the broad reach that makes it different in some ways. And at the same time, there's also a delayed response to it in other ways, where we're talking about you're able to post something instantaneous, but you don't have to deal with any immediate consequences like you would if you said it to somebody face to face. And it seems to be that it's easier to say things when you're behind a keyboard. And there's a feeling that it's not real. And there has been some studies on this where there is indications that individuals will drop their inhibitions and will take on certain different personas when they're using social media and they don't have to deal with these consequences in an immediate way. In combination with that, there's also some societal and very likely generational views on how social media can, is used and how that can conflict with traditional professional expectations. So social media is a somewhat more personal type of communication. You can get into the very intimate details of someone's life. It also can be a very casual form of communication. And some, I know when I write an email, it's much more formal than when I send a text message. Or when, if I ever was to post on social media, it would be very much more formal for an email than that kind of posting. So there is certain things about it that are different when than other types of written communication. And that's what's important for us to talk about today. When a member of a regulated profession, such as a physiotherapist, uses social media, a number of tensions arise between someone's, uh, where we talk about protection of freedom of expression, the protection of professionals' private lives, and the right of a regulator to engage and discipline when off-duty conduct impacts the, someone's professional status. And we're going to talk a little bit about that off-duty conduct and these other issues here today. And we'll start with some of the general discussions about social media and the tension between that freedom of expression for an individual and the regulation of unprofessional conduct by a regulator such as Physiotherapy Alberta. Becoming a member of a regulated profession like physiotherapy comes with certain benefits. And I mean, most of you will be aware of those benefits. You are allowed to use certain titles that signify that you have expertise in this area. You are allowed to engage in certain restricted activities that other members of the public and other professions are not able to engage in. And there's a number of other benefits that come with 
that status. At the same time, there are costs or responsibilities associated with becoming a member of the profession, and those who sign up to become members of a profession voluntarily subject themselves to certain requirements, rules and processes that are imposed by legislation, the standards of practice that many of you are familiar with, codes of ethics that are applicable, and other decisions and the authority of the regulator, in this case, Physiotherapy Alberta. Professional regulators can impose certain requirements on what members of the profession can say and do, and those are done by imposing requirements on things related to civility, respectful communication, confidentiality, advertising, and a variety of other matters that can impact on that freedom of speech and what an individual can say in the public. And you can see that the use of social media, although it's not specifically addressed by these types of requirements, it certainly overlaps when we talk about things like civility or communication or advertising. Social media can be used for, those will impact social media in a variety of different ways. And failing to abide by these rules through the use of social media or otherwise can be found to constitute unprofessional conduct and subject to discipline from the regulator. With that being said, while regulators can impose certain limits and restrictions, becoming a member of a profession does not mean that professionals have to be silent and cannot engage in any specific public conversations or any commentary. So the law does recognize that members of the profession remain family members, members of a community, political individuals. They are individuals who still have these private lives or in other ways, other public life that's different from being a member of the profession. And those, and those in those roles, individuals will communicate with their friends and others through a variety of means, including social media. So while a member, professional member does not have to fall silent, there are limits on what, there are limits that a regulator can impose on what can be said and how it can be said. And a regulator can impose discipline when improper communications or actions arise. And these are not just theoretical actions. A number of members of regulated professions have been disciplined and punished for their improper use of social media. And here are a few examples. We have the first case where, out of Ontario where a physician engaged in explicit and graphic intimate and sexual behavior with multiple women on Facebook. This behavior continued even after women requested that he stop contacting them. In the end, the professional was found guilty of unprofessional conduct. He was suspended for a month from his practice. He had to take an education course and he had to pay costs of $5,500. So certainly some implications there. In the second case, another physician out of Ontario, seems to be a pattern here, of a physician who posted images of a patient's breast on Snapchat uh, and Instagram without their consent as he was using them as before and after advertising photos. He was suspended for six months and had to take a course and pay over $31,000 in costs. So certainly a costly endeavor in those circumstances. More examples, we have a nurse out of Ontario who posted about the death of an individual on Facebook. In a very odd set of circumstances, a tree had fallen on a patient outside of the hospital during a storm, and then the nurse posted about the individual's death on her own personal Facebook, as well as responding to a CBC News article on the CBC's Facebook page. She was suspended for eight months, eight months and had to do engage in some other conduct given her breach of confidentiality in the circumstance. And then another example out of Ontario, another physician who made unprofessional and offensive Facebook posts which were inflammatory and threatening, or essentially he got into a dispute with his health authority over not being reappointed to medical staff. He started to air his grievances and make the dispute public, and he was suspended for three months had to take a communications course and paid approximately $10,000 in costs. So there, what might seem like more minor situations have certainly been dealt with with severe consequences for individuals for misuse of social media. With respect to more timely examples, we're also seeing now 
discipline and conduct proceedings relating to professionals commenting on social media with respect to COVID-19, with public health restrictions and vaccination issues. So a massage therapist out of Ontario was cautioned because of their inappropriate use of, or inappropriate posting on Facebook that was critical of face masks, face masks during the COVID-19 pandemic. Things like uh, posting that masks were useless, things that people need to stand up and oppose mask mandates. And in that case, the massage therapist agreed to resign and to not reapply from the profession as opposed to facing discipline proceedings in that regard. And then another circumstance, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario is currently pursuing allegations against a physician, physician with respect to communications about the pandemic on social media, which include com comparing the public health measures to the treatment of people with disabilities in Nazi Germany and saying that the vaccine certificate system in Ontario was illegal and other comments challenging the public health restrictions in a very derogatory and inflammatory way. So certainly that will be a hot area of topic, hot area of discussion in the legal area of moving forward with respect to communications about COVID on social media. But these, in, in summary, we have a number of examples where members of a profession who have posted on social media have been subject to discipline and have faced real consequences for those posts that they have made, which may have just been made on the spur of the moment without thinking of it. I talked about earlier how regulators can impose certain restrictions and requirements on members of the profession with respect to a variety of different areas of practice. And here we have the we have comments from, we have standards from the Alberta Physiotherapist about the code of ethical conduct for members of the, profession, the physiotherapy profession in Alberta, where they have certain requirements to maintain professional boundaries, communicate openly and honestly and respectfully, respect the confidentiality, privacy, and security of client information, and specifically use electronic communication and social media and other forms of digital technology professionally and respectfully. So the first three, while they don't deal specifically with social media, they certainly do apply to any sort of activity from a member of the profession, and they would apply in any use of social media. Even though it's not specifically mentioned, just the general nature of them would have those restrictions apply during the use of social media by a member of Physiotherapy Alberta. And in the last one, we have specific direction about professionalism on social media. In addition to the Code of Ethics, there is also the Standards of Practice from Physiotherapy Alberta, which again speak to these issues about advertising, communication, privacy and confidentiality, and professional boundaries. And when we look at the specific expectations that are imposed in some of these areas, there is a use the, under the standards of practice. There are expectations that follow along with these standards. And for the communication one, it specifically talks about using social media in a respectful manner and communicating clearly. And when the professional boundaries one also has specific expectations about using social media and ensuring that any sort of communication through social media is appropriate for the therapeutic relationships that are established. So again, we have general standards of practice that apply for, to any aspect of a regulated professional's professional duties and career when they're carrying out their activities and expectations that are specific to the social media aspect of it. So it is certainly something that Physiotherapy Alberta has contemplated and has created certain requirements for. Although there are these restrictions and rules in place, some of you may be asking, well, if I breach any of these standards or requirements in any way when I'm using my social media, does that automatically make me subject to discipline and a finding of unprofessional conduct? The classic lawyer answer is 
it depends. And in this case, it won't be an automatic finding of unprofessional conduct, while certainly one is possible, but what matters is the context of the scenario and exactly how these communications are being made and if they warrant discipline through, after a regulator conducts a balancing exercise to determine if the communications are improper and if they violate any of these principles. So we're looking at an assessment from Physiotherapy Alberta as to while conducting a balancing exercise to see if the regulator's statutory objective to protect the public outweighs a regulator a professional's ability to express themselves in certain circumstances. Those are the two issues that need to be balanced. It's that regulation in the protection of the public interest and a professional's ability to express themselves and to communicate. Part of that balancing involves examining the value of the speech that is being challenged, as not all speech is treated the same, and we'll talk about that a little bit here, but it's really important to have a full contextual analysis when examining these issues. So here, as I've indicated, that, that contextual analysis is important because speech that is along the lines of professional advocacy or that leads to greater public discussion and discourse will receive a higher level of protection than speech that is more personal to an individual or that is advertising on behalf of an individual or that what I would say is that more unsupported attacks, rants, grievances that might be aired on social media. So there's certainly a spectrum of communication that a regulator will need to take into account when determining if any particular case should be subject to discipline and if the posts on social media rise to the level that should be subject to discipline. When regulators are taking that approach and assessing the conduct, you've heard me talk about needing to engage in a contextual analysis, there are a variety of factors that a regulator needs to take into account and should take into account when examining whether something is subject to discipline. And you'll see here that that includes whether the speech was made while an individual was on duty or otherwise acting as a professional, whether the professional identified themselves as such, the extent of the connection between the professional and the other party when we're looking at the, in the regulatory sphere, whether the speech related to services provided by the professional or other individuals. And in those four factors, you can really see that what's important is looking at what is, in, when somebody is involved in their professional duties. So they, it's about whether they're on duty, they're referring to themselves as a professional, they're engaged in communications with patients. These are all very specific factors that look at essentially, is this speech related to the professional's regulatory duties in their career, or does it relate to something else? In addition to those, there's also must consider whether the speech was a result of emotional distress or mental health issues. So looking at the background to why any sort of communication was made, as well as the truth or fairness of any criticism, the extent of the publication and who's actually reviewing this. So in terms of if any social media site is private and it's only available to select individuals as opposed to the public as a whole, whether any expression was intended to contribute to important issues, such as social or public issues that are being talked about in, in the public at that time, and the nature and scope of the damage on the profession and public interest. So all of these factors need to be looked at and are important when assessing if something crosses the line between being permissible speech and something that would be subject to discipline. As you've heard me talk, I've said a number of these factors include whether the professional was on duty at time, and that's certainly an important aspect, but it is possible for regulators to discipline members of a profession, even for conduct that occurs while they are off duty, and that's what we call it in the legal sphere is off duty conduct. So individuals can be subject to discipline for things that do not specifically relate to their career and to their professional duties. And we'll now turn to talking about that 
as that is often when you can imagine that social media use will very often be in these off-duty circumstances as opposed to when one is actually providing physio physiotherapy services. So while a regulator does not have unlimited ability to regulate this off-duty conduct, so it can't get into every aspect of an individual's private life, there are circumstances where a regulated member's actions in their personal life have an impact on the profession and are subject to discipline. Some of the, one of the more obvious ones that we think of when we talk about off-duty conduct that can be subject to discipline is when a member of the profession is convicted of criminal conduct. So if a member of the profession is convicted of theft, sexual assault, some other serious offense, even if those charges don't arise from professional practice, that's not a valid defense, and this type of conduct will likely be subject to discipline because of the impact it has on the way that the profession is viewed by members of the public and by others, and the impact it may have on the professional to carry out their duties in a safe and appropriate way. Although that conviction for criminal activity is on the more serious end, the use of social media is another area where there could be discipline for this off-duty conduct, even although it doesn't rise to that level of what we would call seriousness of criminal charges that I had talked about. Some of you may be asking, well, why is my regulator allowed to discipline me for conduct that doesn't specifically relate to what I was doing at work as a physiotherapist? The rationale for this is that it's recognized that as a member of a self-regulating profession, and as I talked about before, those benefits versus costs, one of the costs of being a member of such a profession is that individuals can be disciplined for actions in their personal and private life. The rationale for this is that although historically there were three professions being medicine, law, and clergy, these the historical nature and the unique position of trust that these individuals held as being members of the profession, society then expected them to conduct themselves in a manner that was beyond reproach in all circumstances, even in their personal lives. As more professions have emerged, society and the law has extended that expectation that individuals and members of the profession will be beyond reproach into other categories of professions, and the law now expects teachers, engineers, accountants, health professionals like physiotherapists, all to maintain that higher standard of behavior, even while off-duty. And this is a classic lawyer PowerPoint text, or PowerPoint slide with lots of text. What is key here is that we had a, there was a case out of the Alberta Court of Appeal involving an accountant who was involved in a dispute with her condo board. She ended up sending a letter to her condo board, basically threatening to report them to Revenue Canada and to the city of Edmonton for various issues. And she signed it at the bottom, her name, and then she put initial CA to indicate she was a chartered accountant. She was then subject, her regulator brought a discipline proceeding against her. She was convicted of engaging in these threats, even though they had nothing to do with her status as a chartered accountant. She was found guilty, went through a variety of appeals, ended up at the Alberta Court of Appeal. And there, the Court of Appeal said that, well, yes, the regulator does have jurisdiction in this case to impose discipline, even here for this off-duty conduct. And that fact that it anything occurs outside of the profession, of the practice of the profession, doesn't immediately oust the regula regulator's jurisdiction. And here, the, as you can see, the Court of Appeal said, while acknowledging the legitimate demands of one's personal life and the rights and privileges that we all enjoy, private behavior that derogates from high standards of conduct essential to the reputation of one's profession cannot be condoned. It follows that a chartered accountant must ensure that her conduct is above reproach in the view of reasonable, fair-minded and informed persons. And that type of comment from the court where ensuring that conduct is above reproach even applies outside of the practice of the profession. And here, given that this individual, this accountant had engaged in threat, 
in threats that were unfounded, even though that had nothing to do with her practice as an accountant, that was enough for the, to give rise to a regulator's jurisdiction to engage, to impose discipline on her. When we're looking at this off-duty conduct, off-duty conduct can be found to be unprofessional if there is a nexus or relationship between the conduct and the practice of the profession, which engages the obligation of a regulator to promote and protect the public interest. Here, it's where an individual might engage in misconduct at a work function where everyone may know you're a member of Physiotherapy Alberta, or if somebody engages in unprofessional communications while representing themselves as a member of the profession, where it's clear these two circumstances indicate that there's that clear nexus or relationship between the practice of the profession and the individual themselves. Off-duty conduct can also be subject to discipline and unprofessional conduct where the conduct is more reprehensible if engaged in by a member of the profession as compared to another person. So a lawyer who steals, given that they are in a position of trust, a health professional who engages in inappropriate sexual conduct, even while they're off duty, given their close interactions with patients, doctors who fail to stop and provide assistance to somebody in medical distress, even when they're not working, all of these types of examples indicate that there is a con there's enough connection between what the professional should be expected to do and what they actually did that gives rise to discipline even in these off-duty circumstances. More specifically, that has been called, framed as, was the impugned conduct such that it would have a negative impact on the ability of the professional to carry out their professional duties or on the profession? So if a member of the public found out this action occurred, would they think that the professional was unable to perform their job duties in their, in their profession, or would it harm the integrity of the profession as a whole if they became aware of it? Again, when we're looking at whether off-duty conduct constitutes unprofessional conduct, it is important to look at those surrounding circumstances and that context. It's important to consider the nature of the conduct, whether the conduct would bring the profession into disrepute, whether the conduct would negatively impact the public interest, and again, the answer of whether something would be unprofessional conduct in, in off-duty circumstances turns on all the circumstances. I know that that may not be the most helpful, but it's really important to remember that it's not going to be every scenario where there is an issue arising off duty that's subject to discipline. It's really when there is that nexus where there is a sufficient negative impact on the profession as a whole or on the professional themselves. And this is the analysis that is, becomes important when a member of the physiotherapy profession considers how they should conduct themselves on social media while off duty, and to the extent that their communications can be subject to a complaint to the college and a finding of unprofessional conduct. In summary, when we're talking about these disciplines for off duty conduct, while Physiotherapy Alberta does not have unlimited authority to discipline regulated members for what they say or do in their private lives, communications that that happen off duty or other actions and communications through social media could all attract scrutiny and could be subject to discipline depending on the circumstances, even when they're not specifically connected to professional services. What is important is that if a contextual, contextualized analysis indicates that those social media posts result in a negative impact on the professional, the profession, or the public interest as a whole, then a finding of unprofessional conduct can be upheld. You would have heard me talk about beginning about how there was a case out of Saskatchewan involving a registered nurse that became somewhat of a hot topic, again, probably just for lawyers, but this will now talk about this case as it's a good example of how this off-duty conduct, how use of social media, and how this contextualized analysis will play out when we have a specific set of facts. So it's 
one thing for me to say it in a generalized fashion, but it's helpful to see how it's actually applied, where we can see that intersection between a person's profession and a manner in which they engage in, in this case, with public criticism on social media. Here, the member of the profession was an individual named Strom. She was a registered nurse who was dissatisfied with the nursing care that her grandparents received. And this is an example of what we would call one of these dual role cases where she's involved in the communication both as a family member and having identified herself as a registered nurse. So they can be controversial as they show how there is an inter intersection between these two different roles, one as a private member of society, one as a member of the profession. Very briefly, as I indicated, Ms. Strom, she posted comments on, she, she was an RN, she was on maternity leave at the time, and although she was a member of the profession, she wasn't actively working at the time that the posts were made. Her grandparents were residents at a long-term care facility. She then posted on her Facebook page that her grandfather spent a week in palliative care before she, he died at the facility that was named St. Joseph's. She posted that it it was evident that not everyone was up to speed on how to approach end-of-life care, and she challenged people at the facility to get all of their staff a refresher on this topic, and then she said, to those who made my grandpa's last year less than desirable, do better next time. So certainly not a very complimentary post, but also not a, on when we think of the spectrum of what we would see as being negative conduct or comments, not very far on the end of being too negative. That post also cautioned others to keep an eye on things that they had loved ones in the facility. That post was initially private and only available to her friends on Facebook. And a couple of her friends replied, and then Ms. Strom said, as an RN, an avid healthcare advocate, I have to speak up. So here she identified herself as a registered nurse for everyone who could see the post, even though it was initially private. She then tweeted copies of her post to the Minister of Health and to others, which made the post public. That post came to the attention of St. Joseph's staff, who understandably felt that they were being criticized, who submitted a complaint. At the first level, Ms. Strom was found guilty of unprofessional conduct, and although she argued she had the right to free speech, including the right to engage in public criticism, the decision maker rejected that and found her guilty of violating several provisions of the registered nurses code of practice and standards, including failure to fo follow proper channels, as she should have made the criticism known to the facility first, that she negatively impacted the reputation of staff at the facility, and again, she, should have, she shouldn't have made comments in a way that impacted the reputation of other RNs. As a result, she was given a $1,000 fine and had to pay $25,000 in costs, so quite a significant monetary outcome for her. She appealed against Court of Queen's Bench, upheld that finding and said that she was subject to discipline as she should have raised her concerns in a different manner. Importantly, when it got to the Court of Appeal, that court held that although Ms. Strom had identified herself as an RN, the decision maker failed to consider the purpose and tone of the post as a whole and failed to look at all of the circumstances giving rise to the communication through social media. It was found that her posts were really about bringing attention to the general approach to end-of-life care, which was an important issue, and that the decision maker didn't consider that Ms. Strom was a grieving granddaughter at the time, and that there was an important public discourse here, one where it was actually important for a member of the regulated profession to engage. So although initially the decision maker had said, because you are a member of the profession, you shouldn't be engaging because that's improper, the Court of Appeal actually said, well, no, as a member of the profession who has knowledge about certain areas of this practice, who has certain expertise, it is important that you weigh in on these issues and that you can be critical of the system because that brings the care and attention that is needed. The Court of Appeal also said that the fact that a couple people at the facility were upset, that didn't demonstrate a significant enough negative impact on the profession as a whole in the minds of the public in those ways. So although 
pardon me, that slide goes to what I had just been talking about, where that there had been an insufficient consideration of these, the personal autonomy that she had in her role as a granddaughter and the benefits of her discussion that she was bringing given her expertise. And there was a failure to consider all of those contextual factors that we had previously talked about. Although the Court of Appeal overturned that finding against Ms. Strong specifically, I will note that the court was careful to say that in all cases involving off-duty conduct, it's important to look carefully at the context. So it wasn't the case that every post on social media will not be unprofessional. The court was clear to say, well, in these particular circumstances, given all of the facts, it wasn't unprofessional for Ms. Strong to post criticism about her father's end-of-life care. The decision doesn't mean that professionals have unlimited right to ignore codes of ethics or standards of practice when engaging in public criticism or posts on social media, but it does indicate that any an individual's freedom of speech, even as a professional, will be weighed carefully when assessing whether this type of public discourse on social media has gone too far or if it should be subject to discipline. The Court of Appeals reasons do indicate that provided that there is a contextualized approach taken by decision makers and regulators and a recognition of the various different factors that come into play, a finding of unprofessional conduct would likely be upheld as long as that analysis is done properly at the initial stage. So after having talked generally about the use of social media, how it can be subject to discipline, how discipline can arise even when an individual is engaging in off-duty conduct, I'm now going to turn to a few specific examples of common complaints that arise from an individual, common complaints that will arise from the use of social media by a professional in, when we're talking about if it should be rise to unprofessional conduct. The first two are somewhat related, where an individual can engage in what I would just generally say are distasteful online communications, which could be racist, sexist, defamatory, variety of different issues, and when an individual engages in criticism of others, including their employer, their colleagues, their regulatory body, or anyone else through social media. This relates to some of the issues we had talked about earlier, as to how social media can involve individuals posting things they might not otherwise say out loud, but having them posted on social media in a way that engages the public communication and the discourse. The other three about breaching patient confidentiality, boundary violations, and advertising violations, they're a little bit different, but also related, where here there may be a risk of any a breach or a violation through the use of social media because Social media lets professionals engage themselves and engage with many others and broadcast messages to others. So it's not a traditional medium where things like confidentiality, advertising, boundaries are taken into account on a more serious level where it might have more thought behind it and social media would allow a more personal use and a more instantaneous use. So some concerns can arise with these other three types of complaints just given how an individual may use social media to communicate their thoughts. With respect to issues of distasteful comments, I've already talked about this a little bit and I think everyone can appreciate this on a general level that people can use social media platforms to air their grievances, to advise what they're doing in a day as an online diary. There's easier to say things behind a keyboard, to drop those inhibitions and say things we might not otherwise say because we don't have to instantly deal with the consequences of it. So just by way of a general example, I didn't talk about it earlier in the other cases, but there is an example where on an Ontario physician was suspended for a month by his regulator because he issued a vulgar tweet in which he used, and I quote, a slang term for female genitalia on his personal Twitter in reference to two female physicians during an intra-professional dispute. And one has to ask themselves was, would he have said that term out loud if this occurred in person? He may have, it could have happened, but I would say that it's more likely than not that he wouldn't have and that 
there is something different about being able to just type a tweet, fire it off, and not have to deal with it again immediately, as opposed to having to say something to somebody's face instantaneously. So some of these, what I call tips and traps, when we look about things that are recommended and things that should be avoided, some of them are going to be very obvious to many of you, and you may say, well, why is he spending time on telling me this? I already know this. And I can certainly recognize that some of these are quite obvious, but in light of some of the things we've discussed here today, including examples of physicians and nurses and other regulated health professionals who haven't followed this obvious advice, it is worth repeating it to have to keep in mind and to revisit it from time to time. So obviously one of the general issues is going to be to use the same level of professionalism in online communication that you would as in face-to-face. -face. And I think that that's just a given. In addition, it's important to think carefully about publishing something on social media. If you wouldn't have patients, colleagues, or employers see it, one of the ways that I do, although it's not on social media, whenever I write an email to somebody in my work during day-to-day -day practice, I envision that it's going to get attached to an affidavit and presented to a judge to read. So when I type out an email, I don't, I'm ensure that if, I'm, if a judge is going to read this, I'm comfortable with him reviewing what I had to say. And in the same way, if you're going to post on social media, it's good to think about would you be comfortable if your patient saw that or if your boss saw that, those kinds of things. Similarly, although even about not posting yourself, it's or commenting yourself, there's also a tip about taking care to in, not engage and post images or comments that might be endorsing other activities or behavior from by other individuals that could be seen negatively, as even that could be subject to discipline. And as everyone can appreciate, when something is posted online, we should never assume that it's going to be able to delete it, even if we take that action as it's easy to screenshot things, it's easy for others to make notes of it. So there are always ways for individuals to find out things have been posted, even on private communications. One of the big things that I've talked about here today is that when off-duty conduct is being examined, one of the key issues is whether uh, that has a negative impact on uh, the ability of a professional to carry out their professional duties or on the profession. And when we looked at those contextual factors, we looked at whether a member was acting as a member of the profession, whether they identified themselves as a member of the profession, while they, it was clear that they were engaged in the practice, in this case would be physiotherapy. So one of, a t one of the tips to this type of conduct is to avoid referring to your status as a physiotherapist or a member of Physiotherapy Alberta when engaged in social media communications. Although this won't completely eliminate the risk of being found to be engaging in unprofessional conduct when you're off duty, it certainly does lower the risk because then there is an issue that it wouldn't impact the profession or your professional duties if people weren't aware that you were a member of the profession. I will say this is a very general tip and there are circumstances where it wouldn't arise where if everyone on social media already knows your physiotherapist, even if you don't mention your professional status, that would be a way to connect you to the profession and engage the regulator's activities even when you're off duty. There are other ways that individuals can find out as well, but this is one way to mitigate that risk. And again, beyond posting things, there are also considerations about whether becoming a fan or if liking a group or post that is considered racist, sexist, or defamatory these kinds of engagement with these kinds of controversial topics could reflect poorly on yourself as a member of the profession or the profession as a whole. So it's not just posting, it's also association with inappropriate or communications. Again, very general tip, similar to other comments, just about that being courteous when communicating with colleagues over social media and about connecting them to your activities on social media. So things like sharing social media posts or tagging others to draw attention to, the, to something, although that is certainly, there are vast majority of circumstances that won't be a concern. 
there are circumstances where it may be that the activity you're connecting them to is that derogatory, distasteful communication. And if you are associating them with that in a public forum, it could certainly give rise to considerations for yourself and the individual who are, you are tagging or associating with that conduct. So you should be aware of your, both that for your own sake and for and your colleague's sake. And then a final tip on this issue is to be aware of your regulators and employer social media policies as they may have specific restrictions on it, what engagement you can make and what type of activities you can engage in. So those are a bit more specific ones that you should be mindful of. In looking at a scenario on this type of topic, we have a question where a physiotherapist connects with individuals uh, on LinkedIn and then strikes up a conversation with them. The physiotherapist identifies themselves as a physiotherapist in Alberta. The messages sent by the physiotherapist quickly turn sexual, including sending naked pictures of the physiotherapist without a request and encouraging the recipients to send naked pictures of themselves. So having all of the discussions we've had, do you think that this physiotherapist has engaged in unprofessional conduct? And here, through the magic of polls, we're going to see if we can get this to work. So here we have a physiotherapist on LinkedIn. He identifies himself as a physiotherapist. He starts to engage in sexually explicit messages with another individual and does that without their request and encourages the recipient to also engage in similar activity with him. Do you think that this is the type of unprofessional communication that we've been talking about here? Or is this communication that is permissible in these circumstances? Or does it depend? When I say contextual factor, are you going to tell me, turn it back on me now and give me the classic lawyer answer of, it depends. Jason, you haven't told me enough about this scenario. And let's see if I can get these results to publish. I hope this works. I see that 100% of individuals have said that this physiotherapist has engaged in unprofessional conduct. So I would say my answer was going to be likely. So I think that everyone, would, I would give that as a correct answer for everyone who responded. So here, as I think that everyone predicted, the individual has identified themselves as a physiotherapist. They have made that connection to the profession themselves. Their conduct likely has a negative impact on the profession as public and other members of the, other, the, members of the public and others expect more from professionals. Here we have damage to the profession, particularly given the relationship between the physiotherapist and their clients. Physiotherapists are often involved, you know, in close contact. There's that physical contact. This type of conduct suggests this individual may not be able to deal with clients, particularly female clients, given his comments. With that being said, there are also additional considerations that could come into play. Uh, again, if both parties are engaging in this conduct and if it's private, and if it's consensual, again, that would be a key factor here that's different than the example I gave you. If it was consensual and not unwanted, then the individual may not be engaging in unprofessional conduct because it is two consenting adults engaging in private communications. At the same time, given that this was taking place on LinkedIn, that is a contextual factor that needs to be taken into account because that is what we would call a more professional site, social media, as opposed to private communications, let's say Tinder, something like that, although I know that wouldn't fit into the definition of social media, those types of communications carry with them different expectations. So it is important to look at these full contextual factors. If this physiotherapist did not identify themselves as a physiotherapist, would the conduct still be unprofessional? There is some possibility, but it is much less likely because if their LinkedIn doesn't identify themselves as a physiotherapist, if they never say that, if it's difficult to connect them to the profession, then there is 
less, no damage to the professional or the public. However, there could still be a finding of unprofessional conduct if this brought, complaint was brought forward because it may still be that the professional themselves, there are questions as to whether they can continue to carry out the professional duties. So although there's no impact on the profession and public as a whole, there may still be an impact on the professional themselves and their ability to carry out the expectations of the profession. Here, we're talking about criticism of colleagues and others. This is quite similar to the issues we had just talked about, as again, we're using social media as a place to broadcast grievances. We're doing it in a way to get support as individuals can like or comment in a way that reinforces our views and our that makes us feel that we're in the right, we're in the right and that our criticism is valid. So many of the same tips and traps that I just talked about apply here again, where again we're talking about engaging in the same level of professionalism you would in a face-to-face -face communication, thinking carefully about publishing something, thinking that about what your if you'd be comfortable if you had your colleagues see it, those kinds of things. And specifically, it's easy to make that impulsive Facebook post or Instagram story about what we, I would call a rant, to use that where it's easy to say, my, my employer is being a jerk. We can be more direct than that. It's very easy to want to send one of those, post something in that regard, just because it's easy to do instantaneous, and it's easy to get the support that might, one might want. And that's a very easy trap to fall into, so if there's a need to post something, I would generally recommend first to engage proper channels if possible. If there's no proper channel to engage or if you're going to make a social media post engaging in this type of criticism, it's important to ensure that the criticism is accurate and not exaggerated and any sort of constructive criticism is more appropriate than an insulting type of comment. So certain legitimate and true criticism is going to be more likely valid and not subject to discipline than something that is just lashing out and that is uncivil and that engages in those more, like I said, ranting types of communications. So again, another scenario. Here we have a physiotherapist who is the parent of a special needs child and who is also a member of a Facebook group for parents of special needs children. A recent post in the group is critical of funding decisions made by the government and the impact of those decisions on special needs children. Physiotherapist responds, identifies herself as a physiotherapist, and is critical of the government decision. Has this physiotherapist engaged in unprofessional conduct? So again, physiotherapist is themselves engaged in this sphere of activity, which ours as a group for other parents who have special needs children. Government has engaged in a specific course of action. Somebody else has posted criticism. The physiotherapist then responds to that message, identifying themselves as a physiotherapist, making that connection to the profession, and then being critical of the government decisions. Given what we've talked about, do you think that this physiotherapist has engaged in unprofessional conduct? Looking at the poll results, we have a much more split decision this time. Some have said yes, some have had said no, and some have given my favorite response of it depends. I would say here in these circumstances, it is likely not that the individual has engaged in unprofessional conduct, but there are some missing details which could change that determination. I would say here that it's likely not because the individual, although they've connected themselves to the profession, they're engaging in what I would call advocacy that would be good for members of the profession to engage in, and they are engaging in their personal lives as a, as a parent of a special needs children. So in that regard, there's certainly more value in the communication than being ranting about something that your employer did that you didn't like, or being critical of a coworker, those kinds of things. There is social value in what is being said, but with that being said, that also depends as long as this type of information is a civil communication. So it's one thing to say on Facebook, 
I don't agree with what the government has done here, and I believe this is incorrect for the following reasons. It is another thing to say, you know, we've seen some of the folks that Kenny is, you know, he's, this is all Jason Kenny's fault. This is completely unreasonable. He's a pawn of the conservative right. He's worse than Trump. Things that are more of those ranting, uncivil language would lend this more towards being on that negative ranting side that could be subject on professional conduct. But provided it doesn't engage in that type of level of discourse, I would say that it's likely that here the physiotherapist has not engaged in unprofessional conduct. Similarly, if the physiotherapist had just liked the initial post, uh, it's unlikely to be unprofessional conduct because there would be a lack of that ranting, a lack of that type of impermissible discourse, and it would just be recognition of criticism of the government. Again, if that initial post is very negative, we could see things differently, but I would say in the variety of circumstances, it is very likely that this would not rise to the level of unprofessional conduct. When we talk about things that relate to confidentiality, people will often forget that social media is not the same as a private conversation amongst their coworkers. They can look at it that way, but it's really not the same. Uh, it's still a form of public discourse, even if it is a type of private message, private communication. There is still something public about it, given the way we use it, and regulated members should not relax completely when considering their obligations to maintain patient confidentiality, as there is an obligation to ensure that social media is consistent with their obligations around patients and their private details. So. There are examples, again, of this that I didn't put in here, but there are cases out of Nurses of Ontario where a nurse took a video without their consent and sent it to a coworker on Snapchat. She also took a picture of her client's feces and sent it to her coworker via Snapchat, really just complaining out of frustration because this facility was short-staffed and she was angry about what she had to deal with for the patient. It's the kind of complaining that would generally occur face-to-face, -face, but given this, it was done by Snapchat and then the individual was suspended for five months for breaching confidentiality. So certainly, although that type of communication may have happened in person, given that it was done by Snapchat, given that it was done electronically, given that confidentiality was breached, it resulted in a five-month suspension. So it is certainly a different type of communication. It serves as a reminder that privacy and confidentiality remain paramount even when engaging in things through social media, and that regulated members have to ensure that information about pa patients isn't shared through inappropriate or unsecure channels. In this regard, I would say that it's a good recommendation to not use social media to discuss patients, to post pictures about patients or procedures, or anything that would identify the patient, unless you have the consent of that patient to do so. And again, that consent is an important aspect. Although it may be a good idea to just generally not post about anything to do with a patient, if there is value in engaging in posting or sharing information about an individual, obtaining written and specific consent before posting is important. Protecting patient information by de-identifying the information in the image if possible, that is also recommended. So even if an individual, try, even if you try as a regulated member to remove as much identifying information as possible, to not post an individual's face, to not give details, it can still be possible to identify a patient, a coworker, or employers from information posted or from a series of information. So just because in one circumstance the client may not be identifiable, there are ways to piece it together and to have that there have an issue of confidentiality arise. Another question here, we have a physiotherapist who posts photographs and information about her clients on her personal and Instagram and Facebook without discussing this with the patient. She never posts faces or names, but the clients can be identified by staff, other clients, and families. One of those clients complains, has this physiotherapist acted inappropriately in these circumstances? So again, we have physiotherapist posting photographs and information about clients. 
without consent. They're on her personal Instagram and Facebook accounts. There are no names or faces, but there are enough information that the clients can be identified by other clients, by families, by staff. And has this physiotherapist acted inappropriately? We have 100% yes, and I would say that that is the correct answer here. As although physiotherapists may have believed they could share client information because the client's face wasn't posted or they weren't easily identifiable, that is a dangerous practice as it is, can be very difficult to completely sanitize a post to remove all aspects of personable, personal and identifiable information. So here, even though the physiotherapist's Facebook and Instagram accounts were personal, they could be accessed by clients who could identify their own personal information, as well as other patients who could identify the personal information of others. And these are the kinds of scenarios that could lead to that inadvertent privacy breach or confidentiality breach that should be avoided. So not the, on the spectrum of inappropriate conduct on social media, it is not the most serious of conduct when we look at some of the other examples, but it is certainly conduct that would breach the privacy and confidentiality standards imposed by Physiotherapy Alberta and the general requirements to ensure that that confidentiality is protected. With respect to how the physiotherapist could have avoided this situation, she could have avoided it by getting specific consent from the individual, an agreement from the individual that they were okay with their, their uh, picture being posted, or she could have just not posted about the client and said something very general or posted a, you know, a photo of the wall of the, her clinic and made a comment about it that way, where there was no identifiable information about the client at all. Turning to issue of boundary violations, all, social media can allow professionals to foster collegial relationships with coworkers, to connect with clients, connect with the broader public, it can also create dangers in a way as using this informal mode of social media can lead to a relaxation of personal and professional boundaries, and those lines can be blurred through the use of social media. So again, as I've indicated, when I'm texting instead of sending an email, I certainly know that my communication style changes. So we're talking about use of social media versus emails from physiotherapists or in-person communications. There are ways that it can be easy to relax the expectation and engage in different types of communication. Regulated members still have an obligation to maintain professional boundaries in the context of their practice, and there needs to be a vigilance uh, due to that power imbalance that exists between regulated members and their clients. As you can all appreciate, physiotherapists do have, they are privy to confidential information about their clients, they have certain skills that they are applying in reviewing that information. They may be seeing clients when they are vulnerable and in a time of need. So because of this power imbalance, members of the profession do have to be vigilant to protect those boundaries of their clients, even on social media. One of a trap that an individual could fall into is friending or following a patient former patient or close relatives of a patient on social media, that can make it difficult to maintain clear boundaries as this type of interaction enables further communications between a physiotherapist and their client, which start to go outside of the professional realm. So you can learn information about clients that wouldn't, you wouldn't otherwise be aware of. For example, you could learn about somebody's parents going through a divorce. You could learn about custody issues suddenly you have a lot of access to information that you might not otherwise have had. And in turn, they can also learn information about you, things that you, you know, your political parties you might support, charities you're involved with, who your friends are. That type of information starts to blur the boundaries. And there may be certainly situations where it is appropriate to friend and follow patients or former patients. It is careful to ensure that those lines do not become blurred and that boundary violations do not occur. One easy way to deal with this is to create uh, an online profile that is just maintained as a professional page. So that if a patient wants to become a friend or fan of you as a person, you can direct them to your professional practice page and use that as a means to respond to friends requests, 
or to deal with patients in that way. This is a, more, this is a way where you can ensure that p patients do not become aware of the more intimate nature, intimate activities of your life. And I would say in this regard, when we talk about these boundary violations, there's certainly context is important. And given where we are on time, I'm not going to do a poll for this one, but just when we talk about a scenario where physiotherapist shares, uh, where physiotherapist finds out that, or she tries to friend a client's profile, it's private, she sends an Instagram follow request. Certainly that may be look like a blurring of boundaries, but it is important to examine context. So not saying that you can't be friends on social media with a client or an individual. It's just important to be vigilant of those boundaries and to ensure that they're not crossed in inappropriate ways. And particularly, it's important to look at the circumstances. So, I mean, we look at boundaries with all the contacts. Again, the genders of both individuals are important. Age differences are important. What was the nature of discussions before are important. Who reaches out to who is important. If a client tries to friend uh, or does friend or try to follow a physiotherapist first, that gives an indication that they are more comfortable engaging in that type of activity and maybe there isn't as much concern over that boundary. So it's certainly where we need to look at that there's a risk of a boundary violation, but the simple act of friending or following a person is not going to be itself the breach of the violation of the boundary in most cases. It's the context and what other issues may arise. And here we also have a generational divide where people that are more familiar with social media are more comfortable using it to engage on a more business level or a more professional level with others, whereas it's, it's only being used in a personal capacity, it starts to blur that boundary. So this one is a more nuanced one that re where the context really matters. And just given the time, turning quickly to advertising violations, again, this isn't about social media itself. It's about what individuals post on social media and how it's used. So when if a professional is generally going through a formal advertising campaign, it is obvious that they need to be concerned about what advertisements are posted, the context, how much is going on in that regard. But if they are just using social media, it can be easy to just say, I'm going to post whatever I want because I'm, this isn't really advertising, this is something else, and I'm just posting on social media. That really isn't the case. If there is any type of advertising through the social media, the professional remains responsible to comply with the standards of practice and the code of ethical conduct. So the, regular, the professional should be cautious about posting things that relate to advertising about their skills and services online, as that can be, as that may inadvertently contravene the advertising guidelines. Similarly, there's issues about obtaining informed consent from a client if they're going to participate in social media, about in an advertisement, and about whether if an individual is going to post a testimonial or participate in any sort of advertising post, there, it is important to ensure that that individual doesn't unnecessarily disclose their confidential information or that they're not aware that that is something that they're going to be involved in. So getting that consent is very vital. And just quickly, looking at the last scenario, here a physiotherapist creates a series of weekly Instagram posts. She indicates that if the post gets a certain number of likes, one of the people who likes the post will get a free treatment. Are there concerns with the physiotherapist actions here? Again, don't have a poll, but here where although other individuals on social media might engage in this type of advertising and likes issue, it's important to be cognizant of the advertising standards that apply. So. The advertising standards for physiotherapists say that you shouldn't refrain from engaging in advertising that offers free services or client incentives. So although the general post may be fine, this issue about offering free treatment based on likes would likely violate the advertising standards. So it is important to keep those kinds of things in mind. Because of your role as a professional, there will be additional limitations on your activities on social media as opposed to what others may be able to engage in and to engage in that type of advertising in these situations. With respect to managing those concerns, it's really just about ensuring that anything that relates to advertising of services or duties is in compliance with the codes of code of ethical conduct and standards of practice. And just because it's on social media, that doesn't change how serious one should look at any sort of advertising. And I know I ran through the last few slides here, so 
questions. I wanted to give a couple of minutes for questions. I overestimated how quickly I would get through this. I said we'd be done early, but we're done here now at 117. So happy to deal with questions that have arisen. I know I saw there was a few. So Sean, if you wanted to provide some of these questions, I'll happy to address them. Yeah, you bet. Uh, thank you very much, Jason. That was, uh, that was great, super comprehensive. Um, we do have some questions that have come through. Uh, I think I will start with the first one that came up. So when you were talking about posts regarding COVID-19 that are potentially under investigation or have already been penalized, is it the topic? Is it commenting out of scope of practice? Or is it the tone or civility um, that is getting uh, healthcare professionals into trouble? So that is an excellent question. Uh, this is certainly an area that's going to be contentious moving forward. I would say that it's generally the tone and the post, the tone and the civility of the post that are the concerns. Uh, with certainly members of the public and professionals are allowed to have different views. There is not any criticism. You subject, you won't be subject to discipline for holding a view that may not be the majority view. That's not what the concern is. The concern is engaging in the type of uncivil or largely what has been called of misinformation, misleading types of posts. So some of the comments I made were things about comparing public health measures to Nazi Germany or saying that masks are completely ineffective. It's where where in individuals are engaging in those more deliberate and I mean, misinformation type of posts as opposed to engaging in what we've talked about here, more social constructive criticism. Individuals can say, I disagree with the public health measures that have been imposed for these reasons. That is very different than saying these public health measures are like Nazi Germany. So it's really that tone and civility that is the concern that is the issue. Okay, yeah, no, good answer. Um, okay, so moving on to the next question. Um, given that uh, people are not always social media literate, what does the physiotherapist need to explain when seeking informed consent to post patient content on social media? So how do you potentially de-identify people if you're posting stuff, or how do you kind of frame things so that, um, yeah, you're following all the rules, you're not going to get in trouble when you are potentially posting stuff on social media that contains patient pictures or information? Certainly. So de-identifying is one way that some people try to avoid breaching confidentiality, as I've talked about, that can be, that's still dangerous because there are ways to identify individuals. So the, when I would say de-identifying, it would be things like not posting somebody's face, not posting somebody's name, not posting any specific demographic details, those kinds of things. But with that being said, as you've heard me talk, there's still ways to identify. So the best answer is to get in consent, where it would be, you would tell the individual that if they are comfortable, you would be using their post on your social media where it would be available uh, for either, you know, a certain period of time or it would be available in perpetuity. And then you would have them, ideally, you would have them sign a, something to indicate that. Again, I, that is the best answer or to chart any sort of consent that you have in their record to indicate it was explained to them that this post would be used for advertising purposes or social media purposes. It was explained to them that it would be available for this long or it would be available in perpetuity. They were aware that they would be identifiable in it or could be identified in it and they were comfortable proceeding in that fashion. So it's really about ensuring that clients are aware of what will be shared and that they are they are consenting to that. It's, you certainly do not want to engage in any sort of publication of a patient's status, the fact that they are your patient, those kinds of things, without them agreeing to it and having a record of that agreement. Perfect. Okay. Uh, there's uh, Next one is, what would be your take as a lawyer on the implications of having a regulated health professional um, having their photo taken at, a, at an event that maybe isn't in best light, whether it's, you know, um, gathering a white supremacist or something like that and then that gets posted online does it matter if they post the photo or they just end up being tagged in a photo or one of their patients was scrolling in the news and they saw you know their physio at an event that they you know felt was highly unprofessional because they're yeah i guess what's your take on that potential situation yeah so that is a very complex situation i would say that who posts it 
would not be important. It would be, I mean, I, I will take that back. If the individual themselves is posting it, that makes the conduct more egregious. But just because they don't post it themselves doesn't mean that there is no concerns arising from the conduct. So if there is you know, a general photograph that's posted in a general setting and the member themselves didn't post it, if it is possible to identify them as a physiotherapist from other situations, if it is easy to connect them to that situation, then concerns may arise. I will say that certainly if you are in, involved in these types of questionable activities, you are likely being engaged in them in a more positive way, but it is also possible that there is explanations for these types of situations. So I wouldn't say that every situation where an individual is photographed or involved in this type of posting would give rise to unprofessional conduct. That's where those contextual factors come into play. Again, things like can they, why were they involved in it? What were the other issues? Uh, do other people know they're a physiotherapist? There's a lot of ways that we look at this. Again, they're, people are entitled to their personal lives. We just need to look at those other factors to see if there would be that impact on the profession and on the professional themselves. So certainly I could see examples where this would be unprofessional conduct, but there's also circumstances where it wouldn't be. Uh, related to social media, since that's what we're talking about, I would say if the professional posts it themselves, it's more likely to be unprofessional. If they don't post it themselves, there's still a possibility, but it's on a different end of the spectrum. Okay, and this one I think kind of builds on that last, uh, the answer you just provided. So um, is it enough to remove references to your profession in your profile um, when you're on social media? Or should you be concerned about people's ability to find you or identify you as a member of a regulated profession based on other stuff that you post or, you know, in your profile you list that you went to, you know, University of Alberta, you have a degree in physiotherapy. Um, how much, I guess, you have to worry about, you know, if you're posting stuff, it tracking back to you as a professional? And that's, that's an excellent question. So I would say that uh, I talked about here earlier that removing the any indication of your professional status is certainly one way to mitigate against those concerns being connected to your profession, your skills as a professional, physiotherapy, Alberta itself, but it's not the final answer. There are other ways, as this question indicates, that you can be identified as a physiotherapist in other ways that your friends, I mean, some of these examples I've talked about weren't just clients complaining, friends were ones complaining who knew they were physio members of the profession, um, as you've indicated, where you went to school may be an indication. So simply removing your status as a physiotherapist will not be the final answer to prevent any sort of unprofessional conduct finding, but it does mitigate it. And again, I understand that I am the that I'm raising a bunch of concerns about individuals will say, well, is everything I post on social media going to be subject to discipline because I am a member of a profession? Again, you are allowed to have private lives. It's not every post that's going to be raised, give rise to concerns. It's where we look at those contextual factors and say, well, where is the line? Are they starting to get to that end of the spectrum where there are concerns about this profession? If you, you know, comment on Instagram that some TV show is terrible, that is not going to be the type of conduct that's unprofessional. If you start to engage in, you know, criticism of individuals of a personal nature or attacks against your coworkers, then maybe we start to get into that circum then we'll get into the more unprofessional conduct. So it's really there's that broad contextual spectrum where it's not just about if you are identified as a physiotherapist, it's really what you're doing on social media that is the concern. And obviously, if you identify yourself as a physiotherapist, there's more concern. If you don't, the concern is less. Okay, perfect. All right, so we've got, uh, we're almost done here. So when you talk about professional advocacy on social media, uh, is there a difference between advocacy on behalf of your patients advocacy on behalf of your profession or your professional interests? Is there really a difference kind of can, depending when we look at just the concept of advocacy? In that circumstance, I would say there isn't much of a difference. Uh, if you're advocating on behalf of a patient, it raises those confidentiality concerns. But beyond that, it's really advocacy in support of the profession, your clients, any of those circumstances really give rise to the same benefits to the public and to individuals. So there is a higher level of value in it. So 
if you're advocating on, you know, for yourself personally as a member of the profession that more resources are needed from the government, or if you're advocating on behalf of clients who need more resources or who need access to different situations, different types of payments, those kinds of things, I would look at that as all as general advocacy and no real difference on the social media aspect, provided it's done in that positive, discursive way. Perfect. Okay. Uh, and the last, I think, question that we had coming through was when you went back to talking about the Strom versus Saskatchewan, uh, the question was how can two levels of uh, court systems find her at fault? And with one level finding that she was not just, I guess, the Court of Appeal found that um, they overturned the decision. So, again, just I think it's how did the court system work so that you can get two positives and then a, you know, an overturn? Yeah, so this is this is right in my wheelhouse. This is what lawyers love to talk about. So when you're subject to discipline and it's the same under the Health Professions Act in Alberta, there is an initial decision maker that we call the hearing tribunal. In Strom's case, it was the discipline committee. If you are convicted of unprofessional conduct from that, you can appeal to another regulatory body, which under in Alberta, it's the council of the profession that creates that regular appeal body. Then if you're still found guilty there, you can seek appeal to the Court of Appeal in Alberta. And then given that you're going to a higher level of court each time you move up, that court will have the power to overrule previous decisions because it's what, just the way that we refer to you're going from one level to the next to the next. And there's a hierarchy of decision makers. So once you get to the more hierarchical one, they can overturn previous decisions if they find there to be errors. There are very specific legal tests they're looking at to see if there was an error. Uh, and that's one of the ways that decisions are arrived. So they're not revisiting the whole case. They're just looking for those errors. And in Strom's case, that error was the failure to do that contextual analysis. All right. So we just had one, actually, sorry, almost done. One last one. And I think it's more of a comment than, or maybe a confirmation than, uh, than a question. So in essence, what gets us into problematic situations is a violation of our code of ethics and or breaking the standards. So when we're posting on social media, generally, most of the times we're getting in trouble because we've breached our code of ethics or our standards of practice. Would you agree? I would agree with that, that certainly that is that is a very good way to look at it. I would just add the additional caution that there is a general provision of unprofessional conduct can be conduct that brings the profession into disrepute so and harms the public interest. So it's the integrity that harms the reputation and integrity of the profession. So even the so the code of ethics and standards of practice are good ones to look at to say I don't I don't want to breach these. But even if it's not a breach of one of those, there's a more general aspect that says have I engaged in something that brings the integrity of the profession into disrepute. So like, these are where we talk about things where if it may not be a specific breach of the code of practice on advertising or confidentiality, but if you're posting support for, this is just because the example that was raised, uh, white supremacy, or you're very direct about that, there are, that could certainly give rise to a complaint of unprofessional conduct for harming the integrity of the profession, even though there's not a specific standard or code of ethic dealing with that. Okay, that is it. So once again, Jason, thank you very much for the preparation you put into this and the time that you took out of your day to day to speak to us. I think it's been a very good presentation. So I just want to thank you very much for your time.